Well, as we continue with unpacking manifestos of the five biggest parties in Parliament, today Morning Live is talking to the Democratic Alliance, which was the second party to launch its manifesto on the 17th of February at the Union Buildings in Pretoria. The DA's manifesto, which the party refers to as a rescue plan for South Africa, is mainly hinged on seven pillars. This morning, DA leader John Steenhuisen joins us in the studio to unpack some of these pillars with, uh, of course, all the time that we're allowed. Now, these include dealing with unemployment, crime, corruption, lawlessness, the education system and poverty and inequality. Uh, those fall amongst the seven pillars that they've highlighted as a party. Uh, today, John will shed more light on how, for instance, would the party reduce or eradicate inequality, given that the IMF says South Africa is the most unequal society in the world. And we also hope to hear from him how the party will shake off the stigma that the party presides over the best uh, or well best run municipalities in the country, particularly the Western Cape, but the poor in the townships live in poverty in those municipalities tell a very different story. Well, John's in studio with us. So good to have you. Welcome. Great to be with you, Leanne, and great to, of course, be with the viewers at home as well. And, and it really is. It's an important <coughs> part for the, the viewer to sit down and listen to exactly what the DA offers them if they go and decide on the 29th of May to put that mark next to them. So maybe in a nutshell, perhaps this is what they will get, because in your opening words, as, uh, on the forward, uh, as the DA leader in your manifesto, you say, for the first time in 30 years, South Africans have a realistic chance of electing a new government this year. For the first time in 30 years, the DA has a credible path into the national government if enough of our votes turn out mm. on election day. That's correct. And it's going to be a very exciting election, Leanne. I think every single credible poll that uh, emerges shows the ANC below 50%. Uh, in a range from the low 30s to the mid to upper 40s. This obviously opens up huge opportunities for alternatives, for coalitions, for a variety of different alternatives to the one that we've had for the last 30 years where the ANC has been a dead cert to win the election. In this election, all bets are off and there's absolutely everything to play for if voters come out and make their voices heard loud and clear at the ballot box. Yeah, and it, it is important. <coughs> I mean... Voter turnout for you is, is very important because mm. the lower the voter turnout, the more difficult it is for you to get your votes as well. Mm. So a lot on this election hinges on the voter turnout. Mm. What are you hoping for in these elections or pe perhaps predicting in terms of voter turnout? Well, we think certainly if one looks at the excitement that was generated around the registration period and the skew towards urban and peri-urban areas where lots of younger voters are, we're hoping for a greater participation from younger voters in this election. We're also hoping that many, many more South Africans, given the fact that political decisions have reached into their homes and switched off the taps, switched off the electricity, are going to be a lot more energised about this particular election. In the past, it's been an abstract, well, the anti's going to win anyway, I'd rather go to the beach or play golf. I don't care about politics, it doesn't affect my life. Well, it has started to do so. Yeah. And I think that in this election, there's far too much at stake for anybody to stay home. Yeah. And I think people are realizing that the country is in peril and the country needs to be rescued. And the heroes in that story have to be the voters of South Africa. So you actually call this the rescue plan. Mm. Let's, let's pick up on that. So we'll start on your, on your manifesto because I want to get through a couple mm. of the points on there and then we'll see where the conversation takes sure. us. But you call it a rescue plan. You're stepping up to help South Africa in terms of, I mean, even your election posters are mm. like, let's rescue South Africa. Mm. Um, so unemployment, this mm. is a big one. This is a massive one. What will the DA do if you come into power? Where do you start resuscitating the economy and creating jobs? Well, unemployment is absolutely the big issue, top of the, top of the list issue, alongside load shedding, because we have a situation where the expanded unemployment rate is sitting at 42%. Seven out of 10 18 to 24-year-olds cannot find work. This is not sustainable, and we need to be able to help grow the economy. How does a government do that? Well, it does it by creating a conducive environment for job creation. And part of that conducive environment has to start with ending load shedding and water shedding. You cannot attract foreign direct investment. You cannot roll out factories. You cannot expand existing businesses if we cannot even put power into the grid to keep them going. And one of the big drivers of unemployment has been load shedding, which has seen factories close and relocate. So the laser-like focus on that, around using the, turning the 350 rand a month 
grant into a work seekers grant, which is commensurate on you being able to prove that you're trying to find work and being able to use that money to access transport opportunities. And then, of course, attracting investment, cutting red tape, and making it easier for small, medium, and micro enterprises to be able to grow. And it isn't rocket science, Leanne. It's something we're already doing where we govern in the Western Cape. In the last year alone, 300,000 new jobs created in the Western Cape. There's 300,000 families that are able to exist off the welfare and off social grants and to start building a sustainable future for themselves. Jobs are going to be at the heart of this next election. And the party, I think, that is able to show people that it's not any good at talking about creating jobs, but it can actually do that where it governs, I think is going to be a compelling message going forward. If we don't fix the economy, if we don't start getting rid of some of the job-killing policies that are deterring investment, then we're going to continue to see the unemployment lines grow. We're committed to getting people off welfare and into work. Uh, social grants are necessary for people who are literally on the cusp of starving or prospering. And, but a job is the best way to deal with inequality, and a job is the best way to give dignity back to the citizens across the country. It, 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 certainly, it certainly is, and you've come up with some very uh, interesting ways that you describe of how you will get people working. And <coughs> one of the interesting uh, things is that um, this conditional grant, mm. the Job Seekers Grant, wh which is, is quite interesting, um, how will this work, though? How, wh what, what, what money would you say that you would give to people in this Job Seekers Grant? I mean, mm. other parties obviously calling it, um, you know, the, the, the uh, basic income grant, but mm. this you're calling a Job Seekers Grant. Mm. How will it work? How do people prove to you that we are are in fact looking for a job, would they have to pay this money back? How does this actually work? No, they wouldn't have to pay the money back, but what they would have to do is actively show and demonstrate that they've been going for in job interviews and responding to adverts, so that it's not just a passive recipient of 350 rand a month, that they're actually demonstrating that they are taking responsibility for their lives and their situation and going out to actively seek work. We would also look at partnerships with business that would be able to work together with these people who are seeking work to be able to marry job seekers and job providers. But the reality is that you know, we can provide as much money as we like to, uh, to job seekers. If we're not able to get them into work, it's not going to be sustainable because eventually the drag on the fiscus is going to be so good. So the point is to get people off welfare and off social grants and into a job so that they're able to provide a better future for themselves and their families. I've met so many social grant recipients in my travels around the country say, you know, I can't, we can barely survive on, on these social grants. They're, they're way below the food poverty line. Would I you really keep want to the social grant though? You would Absolutely. keep that? Absolutely. You won't touch it. In a country like South Africa, where literally a social grant is the difference in somebody starving to death. And you see the childhood malnutrition stalking the country. Absolutely, you have to have the safety net. And in fact, in our alternative budget, which we released a fortnight ago, we actually proposed lifting the social grant, uh, the child support grant particularly, to uh, increase it by 250 rand over the food poverty line. Now, the food poverty line is the line that measures how you can sustainably feed uh, an individual over a course of a month. And all of our grants are way below that food poverty line. And you've seen the price of food. The cost of living is spiraling. It's becoming harder and harder for grant recipients to keep their heads above water. So we, in a, in a completely tax neutral way, by cutting some of the red uh, tape, cutting some of the corruption and the frills, would be able to put money directly into the hands of those who need it the most. I, uh, one of the things <coughs> that I was looking at in your manifesto and what you did speak about, and we're talking about still on the issue of, of unemployment, and this, mm. of course, is uh, the, the job creation. And mm. what you're saying is, is that you're calling for a flexibility to bring workers as quick as possible into the working mm. sector and, and to almost make it easier mm. and perhaps not scrutinize as much as it is now with you know all these labor restrictions and everything that's on there i need to find out from you what you mean by this yeah. i mean are you taking away a minimum wage would you uh, just want to get people into jobs mm. but they could be working in the most atrocious mm. conditions what do you mean by this to try and get people in get rid of that red tape almost well of course what you have to have is a minimum set of criteria around workplace environments you don't 
want child exploitation, for instance, you see in some Asian countries. But what we've done is part of the problem is young people who have left school uh, and cannot find work, seven out of ten of those people are, are sitting at home in that situation. What we're saying is for people under the age of, uh, I think it was 25, to be able to allow them to exempt themselves from some of the more onerous conditions. So they'd be given a certificate that exempts them from some of the more onerous labor, labor such education. As? Well, such as perhaps minimum wage, such as um, notice periods, etc. So what you would do is incentivize their employment and getting young people in. And so there is a bias towards young people being hired into jobs. And this is important because part of the big impediments to young people finding work is lack of experience. A company wants to say, well, what is your experience? And many of them, because they have not been able to find work since leaving school, do not have any experience. So what you want to do is equip them with that experience through this exemption certificate. They can then use that experience to climb a different tier, either within the same company or firm or manufacturing concern, and then perhaps transition to others with the experience now, which would allow them to become a full-fledged uh, employee under the, under full restrictions. We have one of the most restrictive labor regimes in the country. It's a, it's a labor regime designed for a first world system and the type of labor system we would love to have, but which is not grounded in the reality. We have an emerging market labor system, largely unskilled, largely uh, undereducated and largely undertrained. And it's important that you provide opportunities for those people to be able to get onto the jobs ladder. Otherwise, you have a whole generation of people who just never work in their yeah, lives, and yeah. it puts a huge uh, strain on the on the state. And and you are not concerned this may be open to abuse because I think that's that's at the well, crux of it. That people mm. may ask, well, okay, I'm I'm young, I'm desperate, I'll go mm. out and get a job, but you know, I'm okay. You could do with me as you will, but mm. you know, pay me whatever yeah. you want. But I just I need a job. Yeah. Would that not? Well, be Well, look, an there abuse? would be there would have to put in place minimum uh, minimum prescriptions okay. so that there was no abuse. Yeah. Um, and I believe the basic conditions of Employment Act. You protect against workplace exploitation. So you would have those protections. But what you would be doing is encouraging employers, particularly large-scale, um, unskilled uh, factory uh, worker requ the requirements, you'd be encouraging them and incentivizing them to have a bias towards hiring young people into their operations so that they are, are able to do so without the fear of the 192 steps it takes to get rid of somebody for gross incompetence. And you know, I think it would give young people a shot at being able to get into work. And many young people are saying, well, you know, I'd rather have you know, a half a loaf of bread than a full loaf of bread, but I, you know, it, because it's better than the nothing that I'm sitting with at the moment. Yeah, all right, let's look at privatization, because mm. I know a lot of mm. your manifesto was talking about working very closely mm. with the private sector. Mm. It's one of the things you've spoken about for uh, ending load shedding, the issue of water shedding, um, the issue of expanding the economy as well, and, and using particularly the big focus on the formal sector and large businesses. Privatization sometimes scares a lot of people when they listen to this, particularly when we go into the polls and you're thinking privatization equals more expenses. And it is, it's, it's not necessarily a... Um, friendly market mm. to move into. Mm. Let, let's talk about your issues with regard to privatization and actually mm. selling the country off in a way, because that's kind of how people look at privatization. Mm. You know, if you have something from the government, it comes at a, at a cheaper price than if you give it to privatization and companies that are only mm. looking at the bottom line. And they may work, but they charge a fortune cuts out a lot of the population in that. Yeah. Perhaps address these concerns. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, there, there are examples around the world where that has happened, but by far the majority of cases around the world where state-owned enterprises, which are notoriously inefficient and ineffective, let's look at Eskom, for example. You have a state monopoly, sole generator and supplier. They're definitely not providing cheap electricity. Electricity is very expensive now in South Africa, and it goes up every year for consumers. If you don't do something to break that government monopoly, you remain at the mercy of that, of that supplier. So what you want to do is to introduce competition. Private sector capital injection into particularly big scale things like water infrastructure, uh, ports and harbors, and Eskom, where it just makes sense to bring those private sector efficiencies in there. What you actually do by creating competition, and we've seen it, 
let's look in the cell phone industry, for instance. Prices have continuously gone down for data, for voice calls, etc., because you've got a variety of players that are now competing for customer share in the market. It drives the, pro the price down. When you cling to this 1980s ideology of the state must control everything, you end up with these massive inefficiencies, which is why we have a state-owned airline that can barely stay in the air, a state-owned arms manufacturer that cannot manufacture arms, a state-owned diamond mine that cannot mine diamonds, an energy provider that cannot provide energy, and ports and harbors that cannot move goods efficiently and effectively. In those instances, there are a number of models you can look at where you have public-private partnerships, and the ports would lend themselves to that. In fact, it's a model used by many ports in Africa and around the world, where you bring in a ports company in a 49-51% partnership with government, and they then take over the efficiency and effectiveness of it. It becomes profitable for them, your goods and services move efficiently and effectively, and government, government reaps the rewards in return, for the ex, in return by excise and, and the taxes on the movement of those goods. So it's a win-win situation. Look at telecom, for instance. When it was a government monopoly, it could hardly keep its doors open. Public-private partnership now, and a good model, Telcom is now regularly returning good share prices and is performing well. I think that by clinging to this clunking fist of state that must control everything, we're going to end up with Eskom being repeated in every single aspect of our lives. And I think the sooner we break that government stranglehold and let government focus on what government must do and do it well, rather than trying to do what the private sector could do far better, far more efficiently and far cheaper. All right, John, we're going to take a break here on the sure. program. We've got a lot of questions that are coming from the viewers. Still talking to the manifesto. There's a lot of issues we're going to try and get through in the, in the time we have got with John Steenhuizen. So let's not waste any of it. We'll take a break and then we'll look at some of your questions after this. In conversation with John Stiernes and the leader of the DA, what can the DA do for you if you vote for them? Well, let's find out. And also, this is your moment now. So we've got a lot of questions that come through, but let's put a few of them up. Let's get the response from John Stiernes, who's here in studio with us. So this is from Constitution First, John. How are they expected to win Gauteng when they have deployed some of the weakest mayors to lead the country's biggest metros. In Ikuruleni, they put a person, Tani Campbell, whom they also knew wasn't up to the task to handle a tough coalition arrangement. She failed as a result. In Twane, their premier candidate left the place after giving Edwin Sodi a tender to mess up the place. Randall left after collapsing it and destroying it. In Johannesburg, they put a novice who knew nothing about politics. Um, she failed too. I think they talk about uh, Mayor Mpopalate. Mm. Let's go there. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think it's a very unfair tweet in the first instance, bearing in mind that in all three of those particular um, municipalities, you're dealing with large coalitions. And in fact, in Ekoleni, it was a minority government that we were running there. Very, very difficult to be able to turn a city around quickly when you've got eight hands on the steering wheel. But that was the cards the voters dealt us. And in each of those instances, I believe that those people were fit for purpose. Uh, there was no tender given to Mr. Sodi, and that's been cleared up. If it was, Mr. Mzamanga would have been charged and criminally charged uh, a long time ago, and you'd see a news investigation like there is into Deputy President Paul Mashatile now. Uh, you put the best people into the job, but these are complex metros that have had two and a half decades of absolute poor governance, and it's very difficult to turn them around in a complex coalition environment, particularly when those coalitions become revolving doors and a merry-go-round where one week, you know, the PA is with you, the next week it's with the ANC. Mm -hmm. The one week they are saying they they in favour of, of the opposition, the next day they in government with the EFF and the ANC. And then that instability makes it very, very difficult. So the sooner we can bring stability to those metros, the, the better it's going to be. Chwane was well in its road to recovery when the province put it under administration. And all of the steps that had been taken to improve the finances, when we eventually got back into a year after having to go to court to prevent this illegal uh, provincial takeover, the cupboard was bare again, and you had to start again from scratch. 
It's very frustrating. But I believe that people like Celia's Brink are centers of excellence, and they will turn cities like Chwane around together with our coalition partners there. It is going to take a little bit of time, given the neglect that has existed there. But I'm convinced that we, with the right policies, the right people and the right plans, those metros will come right again. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to dig into that because mm. a, a lot of people talking about the state of Tswane and it's looking terrible. Yes, of course. It's and it's a lot of, but, but that's yours. I mean, you mm. chose that as the mm. spot to do your manifesto and yet mm. a lot of people, some of the things that people were talking to, to is, is how terrible the area mm. was. I mean, and that's your area. You're running it. Well, I thought the area looked quite nice. It was covered in blue and, uh, and looked very, very pleasant on the day. Take the blue I certainly, the blue I certainly blue marched blue on the streets and I thought they were, they were a lot cleaner than places I've seen in Joburg. Okay. But to say that, as I said, you know, Chwane is a very complex matter. Mm. Chwane is the third largest municipality in the world by size, coming in only after New York and I think it's Hong Kong. So it's very, very difficult. They're very, very specific issues that beset a place like Chwane, not least of all, the huge legacy of corruption and maladministration that's been left there. And yes, the finances are perilous and the mayor's been absolutely open and upfront about it. Uh, this latest attempt to try now by Treasury to try and claw back grants is going to make life a lot harder for not only Chwane, but other municipalities around the country as well. Yeah. But you've got to work and do the best that you can. And as I said, if the DA was completely in charge, it would be a lot easier because you're able to move full steam ahead. When you're having to bring eight parties with you, it does complicate matters somewhat, and it does make it, uh, make it a bit slower. All right, let's look at the next one. So yeah. this is an interesting one. This is jumping nicely to another section mm. I wanted to tackle with coalitions and the yeah. MK party. Yeah. I want to get your views on this as well. So yeah. Wayne's saying, are you ready to talk with MK? Um, MK, IFP, DA alliance would mean KZN gone from the ANC. Yeah, well, it's not that simple. And, you know, people who, who don't sit in the political arena often do these dream teams and, uh, you know, fantasy league and, and think, oh, well, this can work. The reality is that you can only work uh, with parties that share your values and principles. And it's a lesson that we learned very, very uh, the, the hard way in Johannesburg uh, in 2016 when the EFF started to you know, try and be the tail that wagged the dog. And it becomes very, very difficult. So, I mean, I don't know what MK stands for. I haven't seen any of their published policies. But if it is the usual radical economic transformation shtick of Jacob Zuma, if it's the nationalization shtick that he likes and, you know, all that, it's going to be very difficult because we fundamentally don't believe in those things. But as I've said, as part of the multi-party charter, we will talk to any party that shares the values of non-racialism, of respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a social market economy that treats the private sector as a partner in the growth and jobs agenda and building a capable state and focusing through on fighting poverty and addressing poverty. ANC, IFP, will you work with them? Well, we're already working with the IFP. But the uh, ANC, let's talk well, ANC. The, well, the ANC, I don't think, necessarily uh, believe in a social market economy. And certainly their policy of cater deployment has completely hollowed out a, a capable state. Uh, the ANC as well will not re uh, relent away from policies such as nationalizing of the Reserve Bank, expropriation, the very things that are driving investment away from the country. And what you don't want to do is to end up in some relationship with those parties. And then you end up like the Liberal Democrats did in Great Britain or MDC did uh, with ZANU-PF in Zimbabwe, where you end up being pulled along with policies that are the, the very antithesis of the values and principles that you hold dear. But you know, we obviously will be prepared to work with anybody who shares those core values that I spoke about and we're willing to talk to them. Yeah. So if MK walks a Damascene road away from nationalization, a, radic a radical economic transformation, the like, perhaps there is a, an opportunity to talk, but as long as, they, as their key pillars are incongruent with the key pillars of the multi-party charter and certainly our own, it makes it very, very difficult. Because there's only one thing worse than losing and that's getting into government and governing badly and not according to your values and we've got our fingers burnt far too many times to go into that type of arrangement again without our eyes wide open. Uh, 
What about the EFF? I'm going to come to the next mm. question in a moment, but I think just talking on these coalitions mm. and, and perhaps the dynamics of how mm. things will work. What about the EFF? Julius Malema sat in this chair yesterday and he was saying some very interesting things about the DA. And, and he, he said, what, you know, one, one of the things, and I'll try and summarize it best I can, mm. is the fact that he doesn't know why you guys are so infatuated with looking behind you. Because there's a party in front of you called the ANC and a party behind you called the EFF. But you seem to have turned your back on the EFF and on the ANC of being official opposition. And you're so worried about what the EFF are doing that you're losing the race to get to the top. And in fact, they are saying, you are not going to be the official opposition anymore. <laughs> well, let me tell you something, and you can hear it from me here first. The MK party has overtaken the EFF in our polling. Mr. Malema's party will be very lucky to emerge as the fourth largest party in the country after this election, never mind the uh, official opposition. Uh, and he, what he's using is an Ipsos poll, which is serially faulty and which has been downgraded to a B negative by the international polling agency of Nate Silver because of the inaccuracy. I will, however, say this. Again, it comes down to values and principles. If you layer the EFF uh, seven pillars over the seven apex priorities of the DA, they, they are incongruent. They don't believe in non-racialism. They don't believe in the rule of law and the constitution. They don't believe in a social market economy. They want the state to control everything and own everything. They believe in cater deployment. They you know, focus on self-enrichment rather than helping um, fighting and eradicating poverty. So it's very, very difficult to sit and do business with them. They also sing songs that call for the killing of large numbers of people who support my party. And I don't think that that's, uh, that's particularly helpful. So, look, I mean, we've been in relationships with the EFF before. It did not end well in Johannesburg. Uh, they were essentially running the show behind the scenes by saying, if you don't give this tender and contract and appoint this person, that we will collapse your government. And it made it intolerable to be able to run a place like Johannesburg. Mm. So you disputing this Ipsos poll, because that's, that's, that's a big thing. Yeah. Because, yeah. But, but you've yeah. quoted Ipsos before. No, Helen we haven't. Zilla has, uh, we've has quoted said Ipsos, that's good. We've quoted Ipsos in the breach. They've got the DA wrong in every single election. Okay. The last election, they said we were going to get 14 or 16%. We ended up with just over 21%. So it's completely, completely out. And they've been historically wrong. And we've already uh, released the data set, which shows how inaccurate they have been. And there's a reason that Nate Silver's uh, polling aggregator has downgraded them because of their serial unreliability. But you know what? I'm very happy that Ipsos puts polls like that out because it's going to make our performance in this next election look even more stellar than it's going to be. Good. Mm -hmm. Happy to hear that. And this is an important issue. Yeah. This I want, we need to talk about this tweet because it's a big part of, of some of the questions and also with regard to where you stand. Tabo asking, why is the DA supporting Israel despite what they are doing, killing Palestinians in Gaza by bombing and starving? False them? dichotomy completely. Do you support Israel? No, we don't support Israel. Why support is that narrative the, out there then? Well, is it because, because you haven't driven, condemned no, what they're doing? because it's been driven by the ANC who see this as a very good distraction away from their own failures. Let me clarify our position, which actually has very little difference from government's official position. We call for a two-state solution with an independent, sovereign, unoccupied Palestine living alongside a secure Israel. That is the only way forward to be able to bring lasting peace in the Middle East. We have condemned uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's comments when he says that he doesn't believe in the two-state solution. We've, con we've con consistently said that human rights must be upheld, that the UN uh, resolutions must be upheld, that the International Court of Justice's ruling, which is now international law and forms part of the rule of law, must be upheld. We don't pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. We pro-peace and anti-radicalization on you both think sides. Can you call what's happening genocide in Gaza? It's not my place to call it genocide. It's not. It's not your place either. And this yeah. is a problem. It, it's no, certainly, it's not. I don't, it's, I don't want to go there, but I'm not a political party It's not head. a problem, though. But is it, it not a big no. issue in these elections? No. Because people are saying, uh, for instance, and I'll bring up, a, it, it's, it's something that happened during our State of the Nation broadcast. SK was speaking to um, a flower seller at the outside of the city hall. Mm. I think her name was Delia. And she was saying, she, firstly, she's not happy with how the DA is running 
the, the, the municipality. They feel they're being ignored. But the turning point for her in terms mm. of how she is going to vote mm. is by seeing the stance that the ANC have taken on Gaza and what they're doing there, calling it genocide. This is a big election point, whether we like it or not. People actually are putting load shedding to, to the side and saying, human rights abuses. This is what we are concerned about. I, I By not calling it genocide, I do you think you're not losing I voters? I think that, that, that all of the polling that we've seen shown that the five key issues, while people are concerned about what's happening there, unemployment, crime and criminality, load shedding, the terrible state of education, and, um, and corruption are the key issues that are worrying people. Let me just be clear. It's not my or your role to determine genocide. We have international bodies that determine genocide. One side's genocide could be another side's freedom fighting. And you can see this backwards and forwards. That's why we have international institutions that arbitrate and the case is where it belongs now because the International Court of Justice, which is responsible for determining whether genocide is taking place and whether the requirements for genocide are being met, are engaged with the issue. I've said from the beginning, we will abide by the RCJ's ruling and we will make sure that they're implemented uh, and support and call for the implementation of the RCJ's ruling because we're a party of the rule of law. But I want to reiterate, we are not pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. We are pro-peace and anti-radicalization. And the radicalization is on both sides. You've got some really strong right-wing parties in Israel that I think are holding them back from being able to come to the table to provide lasting peace. I believe that there needs to be a change in leadership in both Israel and Palestine so that they too can have a Mandela de Klerk moment there mm. that can bring those two uh, areas together and we can start moving towards a two-state solution. Yeah. But, which, which uh, but let me just also just talk to you about doesn't Delia. Appear to be happening. Let's talk about Delia. I'm not sure if you saw Delia's follow-up interview. No, I'd love to know. Tell well, me about Delia. Jordan Hill Lewis went to go and see Delia. Okay. And it's on his uh, social media pages. And I think it's important that viewers go and, and view what Delia really had to say um, a few days after she had made those comments. And I thought, I thought they made for very, very interesting listening. Okay, so it did hit a nerve with you hearing come something like that. I wish I could carry on, but I can't. I have to leave it there. We'll, we'll pick that one up because I, I, I do wonder how the Muslim voter feels and if they are perhaps going to turn towards something like El Jamar because they feel they're not being look, heard. Look, Elia, let me just say to you, let it. me just say to you, there's many, uh, there's many people who probably don't support a two-state solution in South Africa and we're not going to be the party for them because... Okay. We're not going to be, please those people unless you stand on the steps of parliament calling for the destruction of Israel or call for the destruction of the Palestinians. And you'll never make those sides happy. What you have to do is focus on making a rational uh, pathway forward. And I'm very comfortable that the DA's position dovetails absolutely perfectly with 98% of democracies around the world who right. believe in the same solution. Okay, let's leave that one there. Um, quickly, we've got like six minutes to get through so many points. Mm -hmm. Voice notes. Here's one that's come through from a viewer. Let's listen. A very good morning to you, Sakina, um, Lee-Ann, and uh, South Africa. Uh, guys, uh, my question uh, on DA is, uh, would be uh, what are they saying about uh, land appropriation without uh, compensation? What is their stance there? I also need to know um, about um, the status quo of uh, the Black Township development, including uh, nearing uh, those people who live in those townships in economic opportunities. I also need to know um, what is DA going to do about uh, Cape Flat violent crimes, those everyday shootings, everyday murderers. What are they doing about the situation that is happening in Cape Town, including the taxi violence? I thank you. Oh, this is Sabelo from Karieja Kwanobuhle, I thank you.
All right. So, Melo, yeah. three points brought up, very yeah. important ones. Mm. So, let's talk about it. We've got crime, mm. big, big, major, major issue. Land expropriation, mm. very big one. And then uh, also the other one in terms of employment. What other do you Taxi have? violence. Thank yeah. you. The taxi, taxi violence. Ga gangsterism as well. Yeah. Let's okay. go. So, let's start with crime. And I start from the point that this is a national function. Policing is determined by the national minister and a national policing plan. Province's role and is around monitoring and evaluation. So part of the reason we are calling for devolution of policing powers as part of our manifesto to solve the issue is that precisely of our experience in the Western Cape, some of those police stations on the Cape Flats have got the worst police to population ratios in the country because the national police minister will not provide resources into those stations. Now we could quite easily have sat on our hands and said not our function, it's National, province and city sit back and, and do nothing. But we can't because it affects the area where we govern. So we've developed the LEAP program, the Law Enforcement Enhancement and Advancement program, which has placed, used provincial and city resources to put over a thousand new police officers on the streets there to deal with crime. What is the result? It's shown us that crime is down 14% year on year between last, the last set of crime stats and the latest ones. Uh, in terms of priority crimes, which shows that localized policing works better. And that's why we're saying let's devolve policing power down to provinces and local areas so that they can better manage the local crime dynamics. The crime situation in Cape Town or the Western Cape is very different to Limpopo in the Northwest. And thinking you can hammer the square peg of a national policing plan into the round hole of a certain province is absolutely crazy. International best practice shows us localized policing is better and the LEAP program that we've put in there and in reintroducing the drugs unit and the gangsterism unit funded by the city and province is starting to get guns and drugs off the street and starting to drive those metrics down. Um, uh, Inyanga is a good example of that. It was the murder capital of South Africa. It's now in the last set of crime stats moved away from being the murder capital because we're focusing localized resources there and we want to do that for the rest okay. of the country. Land, land, land very important quickly. issue. Expropriation without compensation is a red herring and the sooner people realize that the better. They're being sold a foofy by the ANC. The problem is not the unlocking of land. There's large tracts of government owned land that should be released as a priority, well located, close to urban areas and the focus should be on giving that over to developers, to investors to be able to start developing housing and opportunities close to the urban centers because that's where the real land hunger is. It's not in rural areas, it's in urban and peri-urban areas because people want good schools, good clinics, they want to be able to access jobs, etc. And that's why the Conradi project in the city of Cape Town is a game changer and should be the model about how you have mixed-use developments close to the urban center which means that you're able to uh, allow people access to recreation and work. Uh, the real impediment to land reform is corruption and maladministration, and a government that talks about it but doesn't fund it. The, uh, the land reform budget has, has never exceeded uh, 2% as part, of, uh, as part of, our, of our government budget every year. If we're serious about land reform, let's put money into it so we can do it. If you expropriate land without compensation, you're going to collapse the entire value of land in the country, and you will turn it into an unproductive asset like large parts of the rural areas under uh, Ngunyama Trust and, and that exists. So much more we need to talk about and we can't. But oh, I'm going no. to give you 30 seconds. That's yes. it. That's all we've got. Seconds. 30 seconds to tell me mm. or tell somebody out there mm. why we should vote for the DA. Because the DA has got a track record of getting things done. There's going to be many parties that come to you with shiny manifestos and laundry lists of promises. Look very carefully. Do they have a path to victory? in the first instance, and secondly, are they credibly able to deliver on those things? And I think if you look at the seven key pillars in the DA Manifesto, these are the seven key things we have to get right in the next five years in order to start fixing the many other things that are wrong in South Africa. So if you're serious about rescuing South Africa, understand this, that in this election, there's too much at stake to stay at home. Come out and vote for a party that gets things done. There you go, South Africa, it's your choice. DA leader John Steenhuisen unpacking the party's manifesto as Morning Live is running this uh, short series of unpacking manifestos of the five biggest parties in Parliament. Thank you very much, John. Yeah.